Good morning and welcome to the 8.30 session here in Smothers. I know you have already been blessed by a great week. Can I get a oh yeah from you on that? Well, I am thankful that today you get to get in a time machine. And we're going to vault forward to Pepperdine Bible Lectures in, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And you'll be saying, man, that face looks familiar. Where did I hear that young person before? The four students that are about to speak to you range in age from 17 to, I think, 21 is our, uh, is our most <clears throat> advanced and elderly person up here. Uh, they make me feel so young when I'm with them. Uh, let me tell you briefly that a year and a half ago, and, and my name is Jeff Walling, by the way. I work with Church Relations here at Pepperdine, leading the Youth Leadership Initiative. And we began uh, a project that we hope in some small way can help to encourage more young people to think about the ministry of teaching and preaching, as the number of those interested in that has not been doing this, but unfortunately has been heading in the other direction. I'm going to bet you know a young person, maybe a, a, a grandson, maybe a niece or a nephew, maybe it's someone at your congregation, and they're that talkative individual that, you know, you're always, please, okay, Bobby, you're oversharing again, you know, Sue, thank you, we've already heard that story, who knows, maybe that's God tapping you on the shoulder and saying, well, if they've got that gift of loving to share, wouldn't it be great if they shared the best news in the world? Whether that was as their vocation or as their avocation, whether they happen to be at a congregation where there is no minister, someone who regularly preaches and they could fill in, or whether they're teaching or preaching on a mission field, it is our hope that the Next Gen Preacher Search Project would encourage more young people. Over the last couple of years, we've had about 200 students submit little five-minute videos, and out of those, each year, we select four and they will speak at a number of locations, this being one. They spoke at the Tulsa Soul Winning Workshop a few weeks ago. And in a few weeks, we'll speak at the North American uh, Christian Convention that takes place in Anaheim, California. Uh, I just want you to enjoy them. I want you to be moved by them. And remember, as Paul says, don't let anyone look down on you. Oh, I'm trying to remember the rest of that. Uh, because you're young. Praise God that they are not only not doing that, but they are pointing us towards the Lord today. Um, our speakers will begin with Benjamin Brazel, who is uh, going to school right now in George Washington University back east. Georgetown, I apologize. I gave George the wrong George credit. Georgetown University. He'll be followed by Max Shivington. Max is a high school student from uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, right behind him will come Lydia Proctor, and Lydia is your Nozark student right now, yes, where her father happens also to be the president, but uh, don't hold that against her, and, uh, and close with uh, Jacob Brown, who attends Johnson University. Will you allow me to pray over these folks, and will you join me in doing so? God, thank you for these great young people. I am so thankful for the gifts that you've given them and for the way they're using them. May we open our heart to hear their words deeply. I pray this in Christ Jesus' holy name and all that agree say, amen. Benjamin. With great power comes great responsibility. Now, giving a toy sword the power of imagination to a toddler in the middle of a busy restaurant may not seem like the most responsible of decisions. But I had a plan. I can remember a couple years ago sitting down in the middle of a, of a Lebanese restaurant, eating dinner with my parents and some family friends, and their two twins running around the table. And one of the twins, Junior, was his name. He was a fireball but I had brought with me some of the toy swords that I used to play with, that I remember loving and playing with. But before handing those toy swords to him, I wanted him to understand the special significance that they were to me. And I said, Junior, come here. I want you to understand something. These are very powerful swords. And before you play with them, I want you to repeat something with me. With great power, comes great responsibility. I can remember playing with those swords when I was younger. That, that sense of power, the imagination, as I would, I would attack, defend myself, slice at enemies. But isn't that something we all crave to some extent, that, that sense of control, 
of a situation or of another person. To have at the other end of our sword that, that spouse, the boss, the professor, our sibling. <laughs> but Jesus takes our hand and he says no. Power is not about you controlling people. It is about you serving people. Amen. In Matthew chapter 20, we come to an argument amongst the disciples. And in verse 24, Matthew chapter 20, verse 24, it says that the disciples became indignant. Now, what on earth could have caused the disciples of Jesus to be indignant with someone? Was it a Pharisee exploiting a beggar in the street? Not this time. Was it a, a, another Jew defaming the name and mocking the name of Jesus? It wasn't even that. Was it a Roman, a Gentile, defaming the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel? It wasn't even that. It was because someone else was trying to cut in line and be first. Two brothers had come, in the preceding passage, had come to Jesus with their mother, asking that they be given a spot position to sit at his right hand and at his left hand when he enters his kingdom. And when the rest of the ten hear about this, they're jealous because they want those positions of power, of honor, of glory also. So how does Jesus respond to this? It's a perfect teaching moment for Jesus, the great teacher and master. Listen to this in verse 25. He responds, listen to this, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be your, your first among you must be your slave. Jesus is responding to the way that the disciples expected the kingdom to be established. Because all of Jewish history was replete with foreign invaders coming in, conquering, subjugating, oppressing the people of God. And so the disciples of Jesus would have looked to the past. And they would have remembered, just 200 years before, the great Maccabean revolt against their Greek overlords. And they would have looked to the present. And they would have seen those Roman battle standards marching through the valleys of Israel, conquering with the sword. And it was in this context that the disciples of Jesus expected him to establish his kingdom in power and control, subjugating the enemies of God. But Jesus takes this idea and he completely churns it on its head. You listen to this. In, in verse 26 and 27, he says, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Jesus is taking the two lowest positions in society at that time, the servant and the slave, and he elevates them. Showing that what makes a person great in the kingdom of heaven is not being able to control other people. Having the ability to tell others what to do. But the ability to serve others. Jesus was, was doing away with the sword of power. And he was introducing God's way. God's way of serving others. He was completely changing the way that people thought power was transformed. He was showing a better, a higher way that did not lead to destruction, but one that lifted up the oppressed, restored those who were hurting. And what was so radical about this, what so challenged the society of his day, was that the kingdom would not be established by the sword. Not by the Caesars, by the kings, by the generals of this world, but by his servants in the world. But Jesus doesn't stop there. In verse 28, he continues saying, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Jesus is taking this beautiful image from Daniel chapter 7 of the Son of Man entering the throne room of God the Father, the Ancient of Days. And in the same sentence, he's taking this this image of, of sacrifice, of ransom, and he brings these seemingly polar opposites together, showing that the suffering servant was the victorious Son of Man. And that it is in the selfless act of sacrifice that Christ did on the cross that we can have redemption and renewal. This is an understanding that should transform the very way we approach life itself. The way we conceive power. The way we exercise power. Because Christ's plan was also for us to imitate him. The ultimate servant. Because this is our calling, to be Jesus to others as he works through us. To take care of the needs of others as we put their interests before our own. To visit the sick neighbor in the hospital. To take part in that food drive at the local homeless shelter. These are the things that as God works through us, he will transform our communities around us and by his own power. Because this is that vision of the kingdom, one that is in the world, but not of it. It is a story of power, a story of service and sacrifice, of transforming power, of cruciformed power. That, that is a story worth passing on. Have any of you guys ever um, tried passing a message in church? Just by show of hands, just be honest. Who's ever passed a message in church, okay? All right, thank you. Just making sure I'm not the only one. You know, it, it, it could be from, the, here, here's an example, one that I get in my, in my church pew a lot. <clears throat> Psst, pass the gum. That's a popular one, uh, in, in my, at my church at least, in my pew. Here's, here's another example. The guy on the farthest side of the pew, you know, he, he turns to the guy on his left and he goes, Wendy's after church, pass it on. And then the next guy gets it. Wendy's after church, pass it on. And then the next guy gets it. Wendy's after church, pass it on. And if it, if it, it goes all the way down the line, and if things have been done properly, everybody's going to end up at Wendy's, right? But, but if Tim, that guy on the end, shows up at McDonald's, some, something got messed up. Now, sending a message down a church pew seems pretty easy, but, but even from that, we can see that it can still get messed up, right? And you know, there, there's one message that we're called to, to deliver that we really, really cannot mess up. That's the story of God's love. It's the gospel. Paul mentions a a love that I'm going to look into in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. What does that God love look like? What's, What's the story behind that? If, if you got the chance, the opportunity to tell somebody about the gospel, but you only had this much time to do it in, three, two, one, boom, what do you say? It's, it's a hard question. It's a harder question than just that. It's more complicated than just that. And it, if you're trying to do it in such a way that they'd understand and that doesn't take 10 years to explain, you have, you know, three, two, one, what do you say? It's a difficult question. However, if, if we want to be cruciformed, like we've been talking so far this week, we need to know what this gospel is. Because I think the word gospel gets used so much that it's lost its meaning in the church, which is sad. So I think we need to be reminded of what it is. So where, where, where do we start? I think the appropriate place to, to start would be at the beginning, with baby Jesus. Because this is important. Because this 
is really different from up there. Now, what I mean by that is it takes a leap to go from heaven to hay. And it, it takes a leap to go from 24-7 presence of God to farm animals. Giving up that much, that's God's love for us, right? But, but, but hold on, don't, don't rush out of the building and say, I got it, I got it, I got it. Because that's not all. Because the story of God's love isn't just about baby Jesus. Because there was also Jesus, the servant. You see, while Jesus was on earth, he was serving people, like, like Ben was talking about. He was, he was out on the streets with the commoners, the common folk. He was, he was out healing the sick. He was helping the people who were crippled to walk again. He was giving sight to the blind, and he was raising the dead to life. And we'd all consider that astounding acts of service, which they are. But to me, one of the biggest acts of service that Jesus ever shows is when he washes his disciples' feet. Now, you have to think, who are these guys? Number one, I'm sure that guys' feet back then weren't any more clean than they are nowadays. So this was not a pleasant task, okay? Second of all, who are these guys? These are the guys that will inevitably abandon and betray him when his hour comes. Jesus knows this going in, and he does it anyway. That is service. That's showing God's love for us. That's God's love story. That's the gospel. But, but hold on a second, because there's way more to it than that. Because the story of God's love isn't just about baby Jesus. And, and it's, it's not just about Jesus, the servant, because there was also Jesus, the sacrifice. You see, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when those Roman soldiers come to arrest Jesus with spears and, and clubs, expecting a fight, his disciples start freaking out, right? Peter draws his sword. You know, bad stuff happens, okay? And Jesus has to just pull them all back and say, stop. Don't you guys understand that if I wanted to, I could stop this whole thing right now. If I wanted to, I could call down an army of angels to stop this. Here's my question. Why didn't he? I mean, why didn't he? I mean, your imagines can run with you. Jesus could have gone, and the Romans could have gone, gone. But he, he didn't. Why, why didn't he? And, and, and why did Jesus voluntarily let those Romans arrest him? And, and, and why did Jesus voluntarily let them torture him and mock him? And, and why did Jesus voluntarily let them nail him to a cross? I think it's because he loves us. Jesus' love for us was the reason. You see, I don't think those physical nails were the thing keeping Jesus to the cross. You and I both know that Jesus is more powerful than two metal spikes. I think God's love for us kept Jesus on the cross. And, and so often we get stuck right there in that rut, right? Every week at communion time, you know, Jesus lived, he did miracles, and he died. At the cross, at the cross, where... Every week should be a reverse funeral celebration, and we're killing Jesus over and over again in our minds and in our hearts, and we leave him in the tomb. Every week. And uh, when the dead person gets up out of the tomb, the funeral's over, right? When, when the dead person starts walking around and talking again, funeral is officially over. And... That's the story of God's love, right? Him dying for us. But, but that's not all either. Because the story of God's love isn't just about baby Jesus. And, and it's not just about Jesus the servant. And it's not just about Jesus the sacrifice. Because there was also Jesus the death defier. You see, on the third day, Jesus wasn't proving to himself and God that, that, that they could beat death. They knew that already. 
The whole point of, of the resurrection is to show us who is boss over death. Jesus broke a big rule. You see, back in Jesus' day, I don't know if you guys knew this, but uh, when people died, they usually stayed that way. <laughs> and uh, after Jesus died, three days later, he pops out. He put death in his place. He sent death to the corner. And I love that. And, I mean, you got to be thinking... That's, that's it, right? That's the story of God's love. You know, I, I love Easter time. I'll share this with you real quick. I love Easter time every year because everybody gets so fired up about, about Jesus. And then the next day comes, and um, it's all gone. I think we should be celebrating Easter every day because de- remembering Jesus shouldn't just be reserved for one day of the year. Do this in remembrance of me. If, if I wanted you guys to remember me after I was gone, after years of me being dead, when you guys are talking about me, uh, you remember Max? Yeah, I remember him. He died. Do this in remembrance of me doesn't remember, hey, I, I died. Remembers everything I did. That remembers everything about me. I have that on our little altar up front in my church, this do in remembrance of me, and it's always bugged me. 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 And the best part is, Jesus didn't even stay dead, and we're still like, Jesus died, and that's it. The story of God's love, the gospel, isn't just that either. This is the best part. You see, we have that gospel, and God says, You guys don't just get to party. You guys get to partake. He looks down at us and he says, oh, no, 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 you guys didn't just win. I want you guys to tell everyone about it. God showed his power through the resurrection of Jesus, and he uses that same power to change us so we can go out and change the world. For as in the death of Jesus, he began the renewal of all things. That, that's what uh, Mr. Wright was talking about. That's the story of God's love. Now, now back to that pesky question, right? If you, had, if you got the opportunity to tell somebody about the gospel, but you only had this much time to say it in, three, two, one, boom, what do you say? I'd like to present you with saying this. Jesus lived. He served. He died, and he rose again to renew the world because he loves us. That is the Jesus story. Pass on that story. And everybody loves a good story, don't they? Most of you probably know what a PK is, right? A preacher's kid? Well, I've been a PK in every sense of the matter. I've been a preacher's kid, a pastor's kid, a professor's kid, a proctor kid, and now a college president's kid. I know what it's like to be a PK. Part of my duty as the daughter of a great storyteller and a great preacher is to be the subject of many of my father's (laughs) stories. In fact, I'm the second of six children, and I'm pretty sure the only reason why we have so many kids is because every couple of years my dad would say, Hey, Katie, I'm running out of stories. We need another kid. (laughs) But while I have been the subject of many of my father's stories, I have also been the audience of many of my father's stories. I can remember night after night of my childhood, my dad would come into my room and tuck me in, and I would hear in what I thought was the deepest, boomingest voice, once upon a time. And I knew that what would follow would be a good story. But what makes a good story? Is it the characters of a story? Maybe. Is it the plot line of a story? Perhaps. Or is it the way a story makes you feel? You see, I think what I love the most about my father's stories was that they always made me feel happy. The princess always found her prince. The hero always prevailed over the bad guy. I never felt anything from those stories but happy. But I have to be honest with you. 
Sometimes when I pick up my Bible and I read history, when I read his story, I don't always feel very happy. And perhaps that is not what makes a good story. Philippians 2, 6 through 11 is the story of the cross. And it opens in verse 6 where the Apostle Paul is talking about Jesus Christ. And he says this, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When I read these verses at first, all I could think of was that this, the story of the cross, must be a story of shame. You see, the story of the cross is a true story. It is rooted in history and in geography and in a factual time and place that really, really happened. Um, in the Roman world, in the time of Jesus' death, crucifixion was the most degrading, humiliating form of execution that could be inflicted on anyone. You would be beaten and stripped naked and hung high on a cross for all to see. And as if that wasn't enough, we know from the gospel accounts that Jesus endured a crown of thorns and the mockery of many. Surely the story of the cross is a story of shame. But as I continued to read and as I continued to think over these verses, I thought, well, perhaps, perhaps the story of the cross is a story of humility. After all, Jesus, who is God and is equal with God, emptied himself and took on flesh. What could be more humble than God becoming human from heaven to earth, from master to slave, from life to death, yes, even death on a cross? And as we heard on Wednesday morning, true love always stoops. This seemed to be the end of a man who would never say my will, but even prayed in the garden, thy will. Perhaps the story of the cross is a story of humility. But as I continued to read, the image of the cross bore down on me. How can this story, this story that I base my life and my faith around, be a good story? How can it be a good story when it's so filled with shame? How can it be a good story when the God of the universe took on flesh only to live in humility and then to die? How can this be a good story? And then I read the next three verses that say this. Therefore... God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when I read that, I think that I got it. You see, the story of the cross is a story of glory. This is and should be the great goal of all we do, to glorify God. In John 17, 1, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples just hours before his arrest, and he prays aloud, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. The whole purpose of Christ's shame on the cross is the glory of God. The whole purpose of Christ living in humility is the glory of God. The whole purpose of his resurrection is the glory of God. And the whole purpose of the exaltation that we see in verses 9 through 11 is the glory of God. And in fact, he has given this glory to us and one day we get to share it with him in heaven. And that feels good. But I think now that while part of the mark of a good story is how it makes you feel, it is also what it makes you do. Paul was writing this letter to the Philippians because he wanted them to do something. Every single chapter of this book highlights some kind of compass that the church and the people within the church in Philippi were facing. Egos and pride had gotten into the way and selfishness was beginning to manifest itself. And so Paul told them the story of the cross to remind them of the same thing that we need to be reminded of. That if we are to have the privilege of sharing in the glory, we must also take up our crosses. We must also devote ourselves to humility. You got to lay down your wealth and care for the needy. You got to lay down your comfort and love the disabled. You have to lay down your time and teach the unreached. You have to lay down your pride and pick up your cross. 
We will share in his sufferings, yes, but we will also share in his glory, the glory of God the Father. That is the story of the cross, and that's a good story. Part of my own story is shaped by a very dear woman, my grandmother, Ruth Bunton. Nobody called her that, though. Everyone just called her Granny. She was my mom's mom, and she was um, the mother of a very large and very loud farming family. She had a commanding presence, even though she wasn't very big, and we would always describe her as irrepressible. She knew how to rally the troops. Um, and in fact, for the last 20 years on her IRS tax forms, in that blank where you're supposed to write occupation, she just wrote matriarch. <laughs> she was a born leader, but more than that, she was a servant. She became a widow at age 76, and she was left with a prosperous farmer's wealth. But by looking at her, you wouldn't know that she literally had millions of dollars to her name. See, she could have done what many prosperous widows do. She could have traveled or bought a lot of nice things or moved to an easier living place. Not that those things are wrong, but Granny chose to keep living in a simple farmhouse. She drove a plain old green minivan. She used those dollars to send many missionaries all over the world, even though she herself never strayed very far from that Midwest farm town. She welcomed more poor, broken, messed up people into her home and her lives than anyone I have ever known. And in fact, when my mom was a little girl, before sending her off to summer camp, Granny would always tell her this, find someone, find someone and be a friend to them. Find someone who needs a friend more than you. And that's exactly what she did. Granny would find people that needed a friend, and she became Granny to half the town and then some. In fact, in church, she faithfully led the preschoolers in songs every Sunday morning, and she taught the adult special needs Sunday school class all the way up until she died a little over a year ago at age 85. Why on earth would this woman who had such wealth lay it aside to sacrifice and serve others? Well, we live according to the stories that we believe are true, and Granny knew the truth of the story of the cross, so she lived by it. She took up her cross every day, and now she is sharing in the glory of God the Father. You know, scholars say that in this text, in Philippians 2, Paul was actually quoting parts of an old hymn. And while I don't know the tune to that song, I can think of another that tells the same story, and if I close my eyes, I can almost hear my granny singing it. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross, where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down, and I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Everybody loves a good story, and that's the best story that I know. Now, would you please welcome with me our last presenter, Jake Brown. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. But to be honest, that was really weak. And I know it's early, I know it's 8.30, but I could, I could really use some more information. So I'm going to sit back down and she's going to welcome, welcome me back up. And let's try that again, okay? Would you please welcome our last presenter, Jake Brown. Hey, thank you. Thank you. That, that's so much better. I really appreciate that. You know, actually, that's, that's all I needed. I'm going back to Knoxville. Have a great day. No, not really, not really. But isn't that what we all want? I mean, imagine if every time you walked in the office, everyone just stood up, hey, there he is, yeah. Or what if every time you came home, your family was actually excited to see you? Hey, yeah, there she is, cool. Or what if every time you went into, I don't know, Cracker Barrel, you got a standing ovation? And everyone, hey, there they are, woo. We long for that. We, we crave it. We want it. And we look for it in different achievements, don't we? It's wanting to win the promotion at work or be the MVP on the team or make straight A's or perhaps be the next famous person. We long for that. We, we crave it. We're constantly striving harder and soaring higher and digging deeper, wanting more than what we currently have. We long for this. And we have a word for it. It's called glory. We crave it. 
It's a human emotion that we all share. And Paul, the apostle, being human, had that emotion as well. But his understanding of what glory is looks a lot different than our own understanding today. To see it, we turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 9, where Paul writes, I am the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And we would say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, Paul, Paul. That is not how you get the, that's not how you do it. That's just not going to work. Let's, let's try this instead. Paul, why don't, you, why don't you start with, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, who planted 14 churches, wrote 13 books of the Bible, and traveled some 10,000 miles to preach the gospel. Now, Paul, that would get you the, that you're looking for. But Paul seems to respond to that supposition. And in verse 10, where he writes, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was not given to me without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. See, Paul understood that, that feeling a sense of guilt often precedes accepting grace. And that until we feel, feel the weight of our sin, it's hard to see the need for grace. And without that grace, there can be no glory. Do you remember the hour you first believed? And how precious did that grace appear? But that grace wouldn't be so precious, so powerful, had we not first understood the dire state of our lives apart from Christ. I mean, do you know what that feels like to live in alienation and separation from God? Some of you have felt the weight of that and others of you, you haven't. But let me share that feeling with you. If I can be completely honest with you for a moment, before I was a Christian, my life was in shambles. And that's an understatement. I mean, I was just lonely. And, and I felt that no one understood, no one cared, no one cared to understand. I felt that not one person loved me. And that everybody hated me. And over the years, that depression led to despair. And that despair led to the moments that I was kneeling at my bedside, not in prayer, but with my grandpa's pistol, ready to take my own life at just 15 years old. And I made a decision that day. I got up and I went outside. And while holding the pistol in one hand and the phone in the other, I called the youth pastor at a church in town. We'll say his name's Ryan. Ryan had reached out to me a couple months prior to that. He had just welcomed me into his life and really invested in me. And on that day, over the phone, Ryan explained to me the love that God has despite my sin and my shame in a way that I could understand it. And he helped me pray for the first time that I've ever prayed, believing that God even cared to listen. And that moment changed my life forever. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. And that's exactly why this grace is so amazing. Because when God gives us this grace, it brings the to him because he reveals not only his grace but his glory in our lives and that's why grace is so amazing because it's not it's not in spite of our failures and our weaknesses that God gives us his grace it's exactly because of them that God offers us this glorious grace and it's the same with nearly every aspect of our lives I mean think about the pain and the grief that we go through, the seasons of our lives that just aren't how we would have them be, and how precious grace seems after those seasons of our lives. I remember a, a Sunday at church, and it had been one of those Sundays, one where the worship is just powerful. 
where our hearts are going out to the fathers and his to us, where the message is both convicting and encouraging, and where we connect with Christ so powerfully in celebrating his life and communion. And then at the end of the service, we all stand for the invitation hymn, and Ryan the man I talked to over the phone, who was the youth pastor at that church, starts walking to the front, and I'm already excited. Because Ryan's just one of those people that when he speaks, he speaks to your heart, and he speaks into your circumstances, and it's just like he's, he's yeah, he's got me. He understands. He knows what I'm going through. And so I was so excited to hear Ryan speak that I'm already ready to give him the applause. And so we, we sit down, and I'm sitting next to my brother's, And Ryan gets up, and I'm just, I want to know, what's the next study we're going to do in youth group? Or what's the next event we're going to go on? Is it CIY or TCTC? And as Ryan starts, he says, I'm stepping down from the youth ministry position of this church. Because I've gotten a young lady pregnant out of wedlock. And I was crushed. I felt the weight of sin and shame and the absence of glory and grace. And haven't we all been there? That moment that we feel like God is done. This one's too much. This sin is too big. This time is too many. And his grace doesn't reach this far. There's no way God can forgive this. And his grace just seems so absent from our life. Yeah, we've been there. But if you were to catch up with Ryan today, you would see how he's back in youth ministry, caring for his daughter and her mother, baptizing, counseling, mentoring, and discipling more students than he ever did before. And it all started with Ryan embracing this grace of God. And through that embracing of grace, God brought the to himself. Because God revealed his glory. And isn't that amazing? How God can take such a a mess that we create and make it a powerful message of his grace. But for some of us, it's not that simple. For some of us in this room, maybe even for most of us in this room, we still have seasons of despair. And we still go through these times where... We feel like God is so absent and that his grace isn't enough. And so the the question then becomes, how? How can we live faithfully? How can we make it through the times when God's grace isn't so visible and where he seems so absent? A few weeks ago, um, my grandparents had a just horrific car accident, which took me home for spring break instead of uh, to France. And, and as I was sitting in the ICU room with my grandmother uh, one late night at about 3 o'clock in the morning, holding her bruised and, and broken hand, uh, I got to be honest with you, I, I was praying, God, where are you in these times? Where is your grace in times like this where uh, a woman is in such pain? Uh, why won't you respond Where is your grace and and is it enough? And all I could do was was watch the the little screen with all the squiggly lines and just hope that they keep squiggling. I don't really know what they mean, but I hope that they keep doing that. And on the other side of my grandmother's bed was an empty chair. And I resolved to know something that night. I resolved to believe something that has shaped the way that I live today, that has transformed my understanding of God's grace. I resolved to believe that night that when God seemed so absent, he was actually very present, that he was there in that room, perhaps even in the chair on the other side of the bed, perhaps even holding her other bruised, broken hand. And so sometimes... Sometimes God just gives us the grace to believe. Sometimes just God just gives us the, the faith to believe that his grace is enough for us in our circumstances, even when it seems so absent. And that's what Paul says, right? In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, For it is by grace you have been saved. 
And it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. And that's what would cause even the Apostle Paul, who had so many accomplishments, to say it's by God's grace that he is who he is. It's not in all the things that he had done for the kingdom of God, but in the fact that he relished in the glorious grace of Christ. And that's who transformed him. That's what transformed him the man that he should be. And so in those, those seasons of despair that we go through, we just need to step back and then look at the bigger picture and realize that we serve a God who takes a test and makes it a beautiful testimony of his grace. In those times that it feels like we're being crucified with Christ because of our circumstances, we just need to realize that God is using even the mess to transform us into the people that he would have us be in this world, a people who live by faith and not by sight, by grace and not in our own accomplishments or strength. So in those times, I encourage you to just lean in a little closer and listen up because I think, I believe that you'll hear the same words that God spoke to Paul and that Paul wrote about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Jesus says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So what does that mean then for us today? Well, it means that I, who live in such despair, can still serve God. And it means that Pastor Ryan, who committed adultery can still serve God. And it means that you, with all of the burdens and all of the weakness and all of the failure, can still serve God because his grace is sufficient for all of our needs. And so we encourage you today to serve in his power by serving in his humility. To live out God's love as we pass on the gospel. To live in the truth of the glorious story of the cross. And to embrace his glorious grace. This is the cruciform life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, as you go to your next class, I hope there's a name ricocheting in your head and you're thinking, I need to tell her, tell him to go to nextgenpreachersearch.com and put their name in the hat so maybe they'll be here next year. God bless you and thank you again for being here. <laughs>